Okay, I think that was a great provocation, and I love the fact that I set you up perfectly to be an optimist for the first time in your life. Because <laughs> if you'd been on our calls about this conference, you would have thought completely the opposite. Uh, so before I let you all tear into and challenge Jay, I want to just cap it off with one final uh, couple of comments uh, to follow it up. So when I was in grad school at the University of Pennsylvania not too long ago, I fell in love with this term over, uh, after which this session is named, isomorphism. And I was literally sitting there going back to kind of wonkdom and academia and reading and thinking and pontificating with my classmates about you know, what happens to organizations and, and how do we challenge and change organizations. And this term came up and I was like, literally like jump up in the middle of this cohort and I was like, oh my God, that's it. Isomorphism, the constraining process that forces one unit into a in a population to resemble the others who face similar environmental conditions. So as I started peeling back the onion and started reading all the researchers that have written about this, Hawley and DiMaggio and Powell and everyone, I realized that what was happening, in fact, in the charter school sector was exactly what scientists had been for years, apparently, talking about and writing about in all sorts of organizations and companies, right? So what happens is the interaction that typically emerges among stakeholders in a field as it becomes more mature, for us, as Jay regarded, funders, advocates, associations, regulators, become this interesting little web that they all begin to do and say and want the same things. They connect and are expected to connect regularly to increase attention, information, and understanding of their collective mission. This is how associations are born, right? As institutions develop into a field, their participation and their activities become more predictable, more homogeneous. Thus, having become structurized, they both invited as well as tolerate the imposition of constraints and expectations. In other words, they seek legitimacy. Legitimacy. It kind of reminds me of, in that whole wave several years ago, uh, the whole math, the fuzzy math, the whole language fuzzy math debate about <coughs> instruction in science. Now, it can be on all sorts of different rungs of the ladder. But I'll never forget going to a meeting, uh, attending a meeting of the National Council of Teachers of Math during this period, trying to figure out why exactly we're changing math. There, there's got to be legitimate science behind this. And a gentleman in the back of the room, this huge room in Washington, all sorts of academic folks and interesting mathematicians stood up and said, we have been working to try to make math entertaining for years. And I am so happy that we're actually having a discussion about how kids can enjoy math. And I thought, if this is about enjoyment and not what actually works for kids, we have an issue. But they wanted to see, they wanted other people to like embrace a new way of doing things. And I started thinking about charter schools in the same way when I discovered this new thing. This, to me, was this new thing, not to a lot of you have been working about this, but the homogeneity that Jay referred to that would have school has to look a certain way. It has to present certain characteristics. In fact, it now has to be proven in order to be approved. I've shared this with some of you before, and I've shared this with him. I picture today, against a backdrop of regulations, rules, laws, policies, proof that lawmakers have to give people, demands from the media, show me it works or I can't possibly uh, talk about you in a positive way. Mike Feinberg, founder of KIPP, everybody knows him. Dave Levin, co-founder of KIPP, walking into an authorizer today. Scruffy, just out of school pretty much, and they go, we have this great idea how to teach kids. We're gonna sing, we're gonna clap our hands, we're gonna snap, we're gonna make them repeat everything and sing song. It works, Harriet Ball's in Chicago. Isn't she awesome? Harriet Ball wasn't proven. Mike Feinberg and Dave Levin certainly weren't proven. So the reason I'm slightly, if not incredibly more pessimistic is the one thing I would challenge you on, Jay, and challenge you all to think about, is the people out there like Mike and Dave and John Hage when he first started out, and the people who founded the city on a hill in Boston, and all those folks did not have the lens we have today. And there is a whole generation of those people in communities that want to help and support students, communities, and families.
And like many of the early pioneers of the choice movement, we were in eclectic rooms from socialists to right-wing conservatives, from people who loved public education to those who abhorred private education. And they came about with these notions and interesting opportunities to deliver education. And they're out there and we have precluded them from joining the chorus. We have precluded them from stepping forward. In fact, we're now going so far as to have to say um, that even things like online schools shouldn't be part of the charter school movement. And so the development of isomorphism in the movement actually dates back to NCLB. And so before I turn it over to you, I have to share the story. And most people don't realize this, and I hearken back to my opening comments uh, about, about Checker and Bruno's book and their conception of the way the charter school movement started. There was a very large growing or movement, and it needed control. And it did, and it needed organizations, and it needed people building capacity and supporting. Uh, and, the, and, and this is very focused, even though this entire event and day is really focused around all choices, it was very, this very focused on making sure schools had their support networks. And NCLB ushered in a really interesting concept, which was that all public schools should be held accountable for results, and the federal government was going to engage in that, and the federal government was going to make sure there were tests given. And there was one little clause that a number of us working in and around the charter school sector at that point, when it was still called a movement, identified. There was a line in the NCLB that had already been signed off by both committees that said, all public schools shall report through the school district, shall report through the school district for their results. So I was at a meeting at several of my colleagues, some of whom I've mentioned, others who aren't in this room, and I said, this is a problem. This is a problem because if your authorizer is a university, or if your authorizer is an independent board, you have just given the school district's license to take over charter schools. And they said, no, no, you're wrong. That's not what they said. That's not what it says. I said, it doesn't matter what it says. I was a regulator. I've been in the Department of Education. The fight royale ensued. John Schrader ran the Charter Schools Network at the time. He was at that table. Nelson Smith was at that table. Checker was at the table. Lisa Keegan was at that table. Howard Fuller eventually was at that table. A number of people were at that table and said, that's not true. We've gone up to the hill. Don't worry, Jeannie, we took care of it. We've gone up to the hill. They said, that's not the way it will become law. So I went up to the hill. And I went directly over the staff's heads. And I went directly to John Boehner, and I went directly to the U.S. Senate and Johnny Isaacson, and I said, we need a small, and I'm not saying this to toot my own, we need a small little amendment. And what we need to say is, charter schools are accountable to their authorizer for the impact of No Child Left Behind. They said, of course. They put the language in. Days later, the development of a group called X emerged, Literally, the group was called X, and the goal of X was to tame the voice of the charter school movement into a single united front. The mission of X was indeed supported and nurtured uh, by the Walton Family Foundation, and the idea was a response, which was later written about by uh, Checker, Finn, and Bruno Mano, that said, we look like idiots on Capitol Hill because we're all running around saying different things. We need to come together in one unified voice. Because the voice was not together, because the voice actually may have had policy differences. And so what I say to you in terms of that story, X became the Charter School Leaders Council, which became the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, which is becoming a big leader in isomorphism. It's not about people, it's about systems. All of us succumb to it. All of us want legitimacy. But if you're trying to put kids in great schools, and we are absolutely all committed, I know, in this room to accountability in great schools, the question is, how do you get there? How do you know? And how do you engage? And you give the federal government, a state, or whatever body, the opportunity to reject choices for kids? And if you do, are we willing to settle for 150 this month, 1,000 next month, and a couple of thousand next year? Or do we want to be like former President Bill Clinton, who was bold enough, despite his party at once upon a time, to say, I want 3,000 charter schools in this country? He didn't say, I want 3,000 no-excuses schools. 
He didn't say, I want 3,000, you know, this kind of school, high quality, high performing schools. He said, I want 3,000 charter schools. He was riding a wave that even he recognized at the time was a great one. And I wonder if we're bold enough to ride the same wave and to actually overtake the isomorphism that so easily creeps into this constraining force that's become the education reform sector. So with that, let me open it up. We've got about 15 minutes for questions, 10, 12, 15 minutes for questions. And if you'll go to the microphone, we can make sure we get you on tape and say who you are. And um, I'm hoping that you will engage Jay forcefully. <laughs> 